Thank you. Brilliant. We are definitely where a few are gathered together, but uh, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining with us. Let's, uh, let's begin by praising God, shall we? The Lord's my shepherd. Uh, we're going to sing. If you're using a book, it's number 1008, 1008, and we will... Uh, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. 1008, if you're in a book... Uh, on the screen behind me. If you're not, uh, please let's rise as we sing together. Let's sing. Please do be seated. Oh, I think we're going to sing again, are we? No, we're going to pray. It's not on my ship, but we are going to pray. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord as we come to him in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity again to meet together here in this place. We thank you that this place has stood here for many, many years declaring the gospel. And we thank you for all who have received that message and have come into personal relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are proud, we are pleased, we are delighted to be part of that throng. We are delighted to be those who come here this morning to worship you, to praise God. So, Father, as we do so, we thank you that you are here with us. You presence yourself by your Holy Spirit. And you long to move mightily, not just in us corporately, but in our individual lives. So, Father, as we come together, as we, uh, as we meet in this way, we thank you for your presence. We pray for those who are not with us this morning, Father. There, there may be many that are missing. Uh, wherever they are, perhaps some are on holiday, perhaps some have other commitments, perhaps others are just struggling with life. Whatever the reason, Father, we pray that you will draw close to them where they are and that you will touch their lives. We pray particularly for those who are finding life difficult at the moment. And Father, we pray that you'll show us as your people how we fit into that situation, what it is that we can do. But if nothing else, Father, we can pray. And that is perhaps the most important thing that we can do because 
you can deal with any situation, even those that we find impossible. And as we remember that, as we look at the world around us, as we think on the things that are going on in the world around us, Father, there are things that we find just difficult to comprehend. News of the events across Europe with wildfires, in America, in Hawaii, uh, in other places around the world where people are struggling to cope with the weather and the consequences of those things. And Father, we see tragic stories on our news every day of people who are losing everything. Father, we, we don't know how to respond. We don't know what to do. So we simply lift those things up to you. We lift war in Ukraine. We lift situations across the world where people are just struggling. We pray for those who are battling to leave plans where they pl places where they feel that they cannot continue to live. And our hearts break as we hear again stories of those coming across the channel, unable to make it. No doubt in large part because of the greed of mankind. Father, we just don't know what to say, we don't know what to do, so we just give these things into your hands. Father, we ask that you will resolve them, that you will bring somehow blessing out of disaster, that you will bring triumph out of apparent defeat, and that, Father, you will glorify your name. So, Father, we commit the events of this morning here in this place into your hands. We continue to ask for your hand of blessing on us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we sing again? Let's do 991, I Will Worship, which seems really, really appropriate, uh, given that what we're here to do, isn't it, is to worship God. So let's, again, if you're able, we'll stand and sing. Uh, you've got to work out those parts again, but uh, I'm sure we can do that between us. Let's go for it. I Will Worship. Well done, do please be seated. We're going to do our we're going to take our reading now, which I must confess is quite long, and uh, I did toy with the idea of trying to break it up, but it proved to be a little bit difficult. So I'm afraid we're going to do the whole thing. I don't know if I should be apologizing for that or not, but we are going to do the whole thing. So we're going to read from Joshua chapter 8, and it's verses 1 to 35. <clears throat> Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. 
For I have delivered it into your hands, the, for I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You are to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you be on the alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city. Sorry. And when the men come out against us as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city, for they will say, they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. See to it. You have my orders. Then Joshua sent them off, and they went to the place of ambush and lay in wait between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night with the people. Early the next morning, Joshua mustered his army, and he and the leaders of Israel marched before them to Ai. The entire force that was with him marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. They set up camp north of Ai with the valley between them and the city. Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So the soldiers took up their positions with the main camp to the north of the city and the ambush to the west of it. That night, Joshua went into the valley. When the king of Ai saw this, he and all the men of the city hurried out early in the morning to meet Israel in battle at a certain place overlooking the Arabah. But he did not know that an ambush had been set against him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel let themselves be driven back before them, and they fled towards the wilderness. All the men of Ai were called to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were lured away from the city. Not a man remained in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. They left the city open and went in pursuit of Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out towards Ai the javelin that is in your hand, for into your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out towards the city the javelin that was in his hand. As soon as he did this, the men in the ambush rose quickly from their position and rushed forward. They entered the city and captured it and quickly set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising up into the sky but they had no chance to escape in any direction. The Israelites who had been fleeing toward the wilderness had turned back against their pursuers. For when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke was going up from the city, they turned round and attacked the men of Ai. Those in the ambush also came out of the city against them so that they were caught in the middle with Israelites on both sides. Israelite, Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives. But they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the wilderness where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. Twelve thousand men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived in Ai. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and the plunder of this city, as the Lord had instructed Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. He impaled the body of the king of Ai on a pole and left it there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered them to take the body from the pole and throw it down at the entrance of the city gate. And they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. 
He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites with their elders, officials and judges were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the foreigners living among them and the native born there were there. Half of the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded them when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterwards, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children sorry, and the foreigners who lived among them. God will bless his reading, the reading of his word. Which I have to confess, <coughs> I found incredibly difficult. And there are some moral issues in there, I think, which you might forgive me, but I'm not going to tackle them. <laughs> I think we're just going to leave those in God's hands because I think they are incredibly difficult and perhaps not suitable for the time we're gathering together. Have you seen one of these recently? Umbrella. Yeah, umbrella! No, it's a hey, you stick. You go up to people and you go, oi, you! And you poke them in the chest. No, no, you're right. It's an umbrella. Yeah, what's it used for? What do I, why have I got one of these? What's it for? Go on, tell me. To keep myself dry when it's raining. So what I do is this, don't I? Give it a shake. Here we go. Whoa, look at that. Now the rain can't get me, can it? And because the umbrella's up, it can't get you either, can it? Is that right? Why not? You're not under the... Oh, what? Yeah. 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 Is that right? Oh, I thought if I put this up, it, it would keep everybody dry. No, is that not right? Oh, no. That's really worrying. Because that means then if I put it over here and go over here, does that mean I'm going to get wet as well? So what you're telling me is I have to stay under that all the time. And if you want to get dry, you've either got to come under my umbrella or you've got to have one of your own. Well, yeah, that's true. But, if, but when it comes to umbrellas, they only work if you're right underneath it, yeah? Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? So, mm, so when God says that I have to live under his law and I have to do things his way, that means I have to keep it above my head all the time. I can't just think that I can put it to one side. Or if I do everything right, you'll be okay. It doesn't work like that, does it? You see, the Bible says that we have to live the way God wants us to live. And God will protect us if we do that. But the point really is, as you rightly say, you've got to live under it and I've got to live under it and we've all got to get it sorted for ourselves, haven't we? I can't live like God's way and expect everybody else to be okay because it doesn't work like that. But what I do know is that if I live under God's law and I live under God's way so that Jesus is in my heart and he helps me to live the right way, he's going to protect me from all the things that are going to happen to me. Not that I'm going to have a lovely life and everything's going to be fine, but but I can know that I can trust God because he'll look after me. That's my umbrella. Hey, hey. Hopefully, I'm not going to need it for the rest of the summer. What do you reckon? What's the chances? Let's not go there. Let's not go there. I think the youngsters are going to leave us. We're going to sing two songs. I'm definitely going to get this right this time. We're going to sing 881 followed by 870. 881 followed by... Oh, sorry, Abby, where are you? Sorry. Sorry, Abby, are you going to come and do the shoebox update, aren't you? I missed that bit, didn't I? Come and do the shoebox. I'm talking about the summer. 
Abby wants to talk about Christmas. What's going on? Oh, dear me. Hello, everyone. Um, it's good to be back again after being away last month. Um, so, in July, um, we've been collecting notebooks, pens, um, art materials, that sort of thing. Um, and we had a good amount in the box. Um, and I do have some numbers. Um, would anybody like to guess how many notebooks we managed to collect? And we collected 61 notebooks. So that, that's a good amount, because sometimes we don't put them in the younger children's boxes, because they're not at school. So. Um, and would anyone like to guess the total of all the different art materials we collected? <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite that many. We collected 69, so we had 31 packs of crayons, 30 packs of wax crayons, and 8 packs of felt tip pens. So that's a fairly good amount there. Um, so this month we're going to be collecting pencil case items. Um, so we won't be collecting all the stuff on that picture, but. So, first of all, we'll need some pencil cases. So we've got pencil cases. Any sort of type you want to get is fine. Um, yeah. So we need some rulers for the pencil cases. Now these need to be the right size for the box. So a 30 centimeter ruler doesn't really fit in a box. So 15 centimeters is best. Or if you want, you can get a folding ruler which will fit in the box, because um, that will fold up smaller. Uh, we'll also need an eraser, so there's different styles of erasers you can get. Any type is fine again. Um, uh, highlighters or Sharpie pens, they're quite good for the older ones. The schools, school work, they can have them. Um, glue sticks, I haven't got any of them, but they need to be sticks and not PVA because we can't send liquids. Um, we can send scissors to the older boxes, but they do need to be rounded end scissors so there's not a sharp point. So if you get like the kiddie scissors, that's fine. Um, stationary sets, again, geometry sets for the older ones or a pencil case with the items in it, that, that's fine too. Um, uh, one thing, that we, well, it's fine if you get them, but we don't need any pencils or writing pens because we have a lot in the cupboard already. So if you want to get some, that's fine, but we're not particularly needing any. So if you can get the stuff that I've put up there, that would be great. And I've got flyers again and the green box will be in the foyer, and if you have any questions, you can come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Seventy. So they are, Lord, I lift your name on high, and Jesus is the name we honour, and I guess the youngsters are going to leave us as we go at the end of the two songs. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Let's stand if we're able and sing. <laughs>
and Kathy's going to take the youngsters out. Should we pray for them as they go? Let's, let's hand them over to the Lord. Father, we thank you for our young people. We thank you for the joy that they bring us. And as they leave us now to go and do their own thing and to consider your word, Father, we pray that you will bless them and their teachers in Jesus' name. And as we come to this difficult passage, Father, we pray that you'll help us to glean something from it that can be useful in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've been giving the, uh, the title, De Turning Defeat into Victory, and that's uh, certainly what uh, was needed for the children of Israel. You will recall that they had set out to capture the city of Ai, but they had been defeated. They lost 36 lives in the attempt and whilst there were various factors contributing to their defeat, a significant factor was the presence of sin among them that had not been dealt with. Um, and that really was what led to their downfall. And God takes Joshua aside at the beginning of chapter 8 and he says to him, I don't want you to fear. I want you now to do what it is that I am calling on you to do. The name Ai um, translates actually to a heap of ruins. That's what it actually means, a heap of ruins. And interestingly, the first reference to this city appears in the book of Genesis, um, specifically linked to the life of Abraham in Genesis 12 and 13. And it's mentioned that Abraham set up his tent between Bethel and Ai. And Bethel translates to the house of God. I spent a little bit of time thinking about that. I wondered if that was perhaps the experience of my life, that somehow I've set up my tent somewhere between the house of God and a place of, and a heap of ruins. And I wonder where, if I were to draw a line, I wonder where my tent is in my daily life. Is it Closer to the heap of ruins or closer to the, the house of God? Where have we pitched our tents? Are we living in a place of victory and blessings represented by Bethel? Or are we dwelling in a place of defeat and misery symbolized by AI? The choice, of course, is ours. We can choose, to a large extent, how we live our Christian lives. But I think it's quite likely that if we're honest with ourselves, and certainly I was being honest with myself, that we have pitched our tent somewhere between the two. And this story, I think, in terms of turning defeat into victory, and as I said earlier, parking perhaps some of the really difficult moral issues, but confronting this from the point of view that there are things in our lives that somehow we need to defeat. Our lives sometimes can feel that they are perhaps further away from God than we would want them to be, and we find ourselves losing battles to those things which I don't know about your experience, but mine is they, they come up time and time and time again. And I have to learn somehow to come into that close relationship with God and allow him to help me deal with them. And I want to suggest to you this morning that through the guidance of the Lord, it is possible for us to discover how to am ambush and conquer those personal AIs that we have in our lives so that we can emerge victorious in the power of God. And I have to confess, I'm not privy to the specific battles that you're facing this morning, but I am confident that whatever they are, God, with God's help, victory is attainable. And perhaps to a degree, taking this passage that we've read here together, we can find a strategy to live our own lives and claim triumph over the challenges 
that we face. And the first thing I really want you to note is this. Victory is promised. God promises victory to his people. When the Lord speaks to Joshua after the death of Achan, God tells him to go to Ai. Go back to that place where you suffered so badly and you felt that things weren't right. But this time, things will be different. This time, you will experience victory. It's interesting, I think, that the Lord called them to go back to the place of their greatest defeat. God knew that they needed to overcome the defeat at Ai before they could move on in the conquest of Canaan. I think the same truth applies to us this morning. How many times have we found ourselves on the losing side against our own human weakness? How often have we faced defeat in the presence of our old sinful nature, succumbing to its desires? How many times have we stumbled Wondering if there's a way back to where we once stood. I believe there's a message from the Lord for us today. Pay attention to what he told Joshua. Fear not. Don't be afraid. And those words are directed at us as well. Especially to those of us who have stumbled and lost battles to our, home human, our own human tendencies. God says... God's message is clear. Fear not, victory can be yours. Because victory is promised to us as a believer. Jesus, as he hung there on the cross, cried out, It is finished. The victory is now possible. Living in defeat isn't the Christian destiny. We don't need to any longer be enslaved by sin, the flesh, or the devil. Paul said that when he wrote to the Romans, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are no longer under law, but under grace. God has given us, says Paul writing to the Corinthians, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we sing, Jesus is the name we honour. Victory is promised. God didn't save us only to leave us defeated. He saved us to walk confidently in the victory that he gives to everyone who chooses to follow him rather than to live their lives their own way in God's world. God tells them that they will do to Ai what they did to Jericho except for the fact that in Ai they can take the spoils for themselves. So if Achan had waited just a few more days, then he could have had all the riches that he could have imagined. But instead, he ran ahead of God and grabbed for himself that which was forbidden. And as a result, well, he paid the ultimate price. You see, I believe that we as believers need to spend time waiting on God. Allowing him to guide and orchestrate the things that should be present in our lives. And if we could just get that mindset and just relax in him and let him take control, that would undoubtedly serve us well. But the problem we face is that our human nature is still here. It's still with us. I've I've often battled with that. Why does God leave my human nature in place so that there is this war going on inside me? What I want to do versus what God wants me to do. And the battle goes on and on and on. And the trap is that sin often promises us instant gratification. I get what I want and I get it now. Yeah, I can save up and go and buy it, but if I steal it, I can have it now. Yeah, I can wait for that, but what if I just take it? Oh, you're really annoying me. I think I'm just going to have to get angry and have done with it. 
Ah, I feel better now that I've got angry. Instant gratification. <clears throat> Those shortcuts seem good at the time because they give us that instant gratification. But really, what we need to be doing is waiting for God's timing. Ask him to hold us back, to allow him to take that place in our lives that means he can do what he wants to do rather than grabbing it for ourselves. In every area of life, the superior choice is to wait for the Lord and allow his best plans to unfold in our lives. It's always wiser to let him lead rather than to impulsively rush ahead. And as we master the art of waiting on the Lord, that's how we pave the way to victory. And I'm not just talking about patience. I'm talking about trust. Believing that if I wait on the Lord, if I let him determine the timing, if I wait till I'm clear what it is that he wants me to do, then I demonstrate that I trust him and I will see the amazing things that he can do. Just as a seed planted in the ground takes time to turn into a magnificent tree or a bush, waiting on the Lord allows his best plans to unfold in our life. So I want to suggest to you this morning that you embrace the art of waiting and see how it guides you on the path to victory. I remember some years ago reading John Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted. If you haven't read it, it's a, it's a good read. And Ortberg tells the story of how one day he was going to become a pastor and he was phoning around his friends saying, I've got this job as a pastor in a church and I'd like you to give me some advice. And one of his friends said to him, John, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. And Ortberg waited and said, yeah, and? And he said, no, there is no and. Just ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Don't be in a rush to get anywhere. Organise your life so that you have time to do the things that you need to do. And let God do the rest. I've tried many times to live my life that way. And I tell you, I have seen some amazing things happen when I let that get into my psyche. I once got across London in a time that it is impossible to get across London in. Simply because I went, whatever will be, will be, Lord, this is yours. And I made the train I thought I was going to miss by about 40 minutes. And I still to this day have no idea how on earth that happened. But the point really is that when we allow God to take control of our circumstances and we hand them over to him, victory is promised. But I want to suggest too that not only is victory promise, but it has to be pursued. God set out a plan for them. He told them in exact detail how they were to mount their attack against AI. He told them they were to lay ambush. They would take the city and all its inhabitants. Of course, Israel knew what happens when you do things the Lord's way. When you fight the battle following his plan, however ridiculous it might seem, you cannot fail. And they had also learned what happens when they don't do it God's way. They learned what the future was that awaited the person who went against God's will. If you and I want to gain the victory over the things that we battle with in life, then we have to do it God's way. No other plan will work. So, if you're going to win the victory in your life, there are, I want to suggest, four things that you need to think very carefully about. First of all, you need the Word of God. You need the Bible. You need to make that part of your psyche. That's how God gives you 
direction in your life. That's how he speaks to us today, primarily, through his word. And like this passage we've looked at today, there will be things that we go, I don't understand. I don't get it. 12,000 people murdered, killed. Do I understand that? Absolutely not. But as I went through this passage, did I find things that God can teach me about how I am to live in the 21st century? Absolutely I can. Can I match those things up with things that Jesus talked about and the apostles talked about in the New Testament? Absolutely I can. Can I find patterns that make sense to the way God wants me to live my life? You can be absolutely sure of it. So the first thing I need to do is I need to make the Word of God a real central part of my life. Secondly, I need to pray. I cannot underestimate the power of prayer. We can read God's word, but unless we pray it through and speak to God about it, we cannot really hope to understand it. And if we are going to get those principles in our lives, we need to spend time talking them through with our Heavenly Father, sharing with him the things we don't understand, leaving with him the things with which we battle, and asking him to impose on us his way of living. The third thing, this might not be very popular, it's okay with this congregation, might not be too popular out there, you need to come to church. You need to meet with other people. If people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, listen, I don't need to go home to be married. But if I want my marriage to work, it's probably a good idea that I go. The same I suggest is true of being a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. In the same ways, you don't have to go home to be married. But if you really want it to work, you need to rub shoulders with other people and get the corners knocked off and share your concerns, and share your thoughts, and pray together about the Word of God. Because it's as you do that, that God builds His kingdom. And linked to that, the fourth thing is we need to have fellowship with other believers. We need to be strengthened by meeting together. None of those things will give us victory and in and of themselves. But when we bring them all together, God is able to move mightily in our lives. And if we neglect even one of those areas, then we can be sure that we will suffer spiritually. But it's important to remember that it's not what I do that makes the difference. It's the power of God that makes the difference. And what I'm doing when I do these things is opening up my life so that I can wait on him and allow him to bring that victory in my own life. The children of Israel had gone to Ai the first time in their own strength. Everything's going to be fine. We can cope with this. We only need 3,000 men. Everything will be okay. And it all went horribly wrong. But here in Joshua 8, they went to battle walking in the power of God. And they were victorious. If we try to live, embark on the spiritual battles of life, relying solely on our own strength, we're heading towards defeat. We cannot hope to win. There is a single route to triumph in these battles, and that is to learn how to access and harness the power of God in, your, in our lives. And it's essential to recognize that when victory seems unattainable, God is capable. When we feel helpless against the forces that pull against us so strongly, the pressures of the world, 
God will step in and fight the battle on our behalf. So what's the secret to beating those things that we find so difficult in our lives? It's to enhance, to embrace the power of God. To let him be central to everything that we do in his word, in our prayer life, in our coming to church, in our fellowship with others. That's how we will achieve the victory by tapping into the power of God. We need to depend on God's power to conquer those struggles within us. When we operate within God's power, we're equipped to withstand the challenges that threaten to defeat us. It's in his power that we will find the ultimate victory. The victory is promised. The victory is pursued, needs to be pursued. But finally, the victory must be preserved. Israel has obediently followed God's plan. They've won, but the challenge isn't over. They must now safeguard their victory. And that phase involves two critical steps that hold a profound lesson for us. Just as Israel triumphed over their defeat, we too can conquer the struggles that we face. We can align our lives with God's will and remain spiritually alive. But to do that, we have to adopt the same strategic steps that Israel took. And I think one profound thing emerges. Victory is preserved through surrender. Not an easy path. And it's difficult as I've said a couple of times already this morning, I battled with the morality of this aspect in the, in the actual events. But the crucial message, I think, lies in recognising the battle between our will and God's will. Thankfully, there will come a day when this battle with our flesh will end. In that moment, the Lord will deliver us, transforming us to be like him. But until that day arrives, we're tasked with silencing the things that obstruct our journey. Just as Israel needed to root out the enemy to safeguard their victory, we need to root out the things that hinder our spiritual progress. The first thing they did to preserve their victory was they dedicated themselves. Did you notice that? They carried out an act of devotion. Their action models what is essential for us. Living in obedience to God's word. Just picture this for a second. Half the nation stands on Mount Ebal, while the other half stands on Mount Gerizim. The Levites stand in the valley between, reading blessings and curses. And a shout of Amen echoes as they respond to each. What they're doing here is exercising, reinforcing their commitment to daily living by God's word. To secure a long-lasting victory over fleshly desires, we have to immerse ourselves in God's things. We have to be devoted to those things. We have to do what God tells us to do and not do what he tells us not to do. So I want to suggest to you this morning that as I've done over the last week, we need to, all of us needs to be reflecting upon what we're devoted to. Somebody has said, where your heart is, there your treasure is. Jesus, wasn't it? But we do have to think about what it is that we are devoted to. What really matters in your life? Because it's when you get what really matters in your life clearly into focus that that will help you to put to death the things that need to be dealt with. Safeguarding victory 
necessitates surrendering to God's will and embracing the devotion to live God's way. Can we be transparent with the Lord today? Can we this morning say, I need help in my life? I'm well aware of my struggles and defeats. If that resonates with you today, then this is your opportunity to come in prayer to the Lord. Commit again to him your devotion. And ask him to help you to fight the battles that without him and without his direction, you can be sure you will lose. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never given your life to God. Maybe that's never happened. Well, if that's you this morning, you need God's power in your life. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So if you need that victory, having never received it before, then you need the salvation that only Jesus can give. But wherever we stand this morning in our relationship with God, we are probably somewhere between the house of God and the place of ruin, the heap of ruins. I don't know today what your specific needs are. But I do know that God is capable of meeting those needs. Are you willing to come before him? Seek what is necessary for you to lead your life in the way that is pleasing to him? That's what was happening really here at AI. The choice is ours. God stands ready to help us. Will we come to him and seek his plan and his intervention so that we can live our lives in a way that honours him, honour him and please him? Pray that God will help us to confront the reality of the situation that we face and to turn the defeats, let's be honest, that we all have from times into victories that will glorify the name of God. Thank you for listening. God bless you, help you, and encourage you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again in closing 769, Who is on the Lord's side, which seems an appropriate song to sing. And I hope that in our hearts we'll be saying, I am. Let's rise as we sing at the close of our service together.
let's pray, shall we? Please be seated if you prefer. Let's just pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for all that it will teach us, even though sometimes we confess we find it difficult. But Father, we thank you that victory is promised for those who put their faith and trust in you. Father, we thank you that it can be pursued. And Father, we ask that you will help us to pursue it and that having attained that victory in our lives, that we will do all that we can with your power to preserve it so that we can be drawn into your presence and that you will receive us with those words that we long to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, take away from our thoughts, we pray, anything that is unhelpful this morning and just help us to focus on our relationship with you and with each other and with those around us so that we can build a kingdom of your people in your name. So, Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for the refreshment we're about to share. We ask your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen.